the, uh, the complementary thing on the consumer side, roughly, right? Um, because as consumers come up with new things, they find them exciting. Uh, innovation seems to be working. So we'll have with us Matthew Krepsig from uh, Nielsen, the executive director. Matthew, come on up. We also have Gioti Jane, who's the senior regional manager um, of Wanderless International Asia Pacific. And finally, we have Balaji Ramanujan, who is from 3M, he is the regional business leader there. I'll get to Balaji later on, he's a big soccer fan like myself. And he loves Bayern Munich, right? If we have we have time. We'll get to that. But before we get to Bayern Munich, and after my microphone has been fixed, I'll ask Matthew about the middle class. Right? That's on everybody's mind, isn't it? The rising middle class. The rising, growing middle, growing middle class. Everybody wants to understand it. We'll hear in a moment what Nielsen is, is, is doing about the middle class, and what Nielsen has found out about the middle class. But you know, to start from uh, from the basics, you know, as a professor, I have to ask you, how do you define middle class? Absolutely. It's a great question, it's a big challenge in any respects. We need a microphone uh, fixed as well for the Going to the hotel room. So I'll be back in about 10 minutes, 15 minutes. But I'll, I'll send it well, to I you. I think they're still in. You just need to change the channel. <laughs> yeah, this is the embarrassing situation when somebody goes to the bathroom with a microphone. Uh, <laughs> but if you think about the middle class, and so for me, when I look at it, we want to turn it into a way that we can apply it, we can understand it. We want to make a take a consumer view of it. And so if I think about defining the middle class, for me, and for us at Nielsen, the way we start to look at it is we take a behavioral-based approach. We actually start to say a middle-class consumer is a consumer that reaches that tipping point, where they can start to make decisions with their disposable income. Those decisions can be brands that they want to buy. I can walk into a shop and say, I now have the money and the ability to choose brand A or brand B. Also, I now have the ability to choose which need is more important. So do I want to buy better grocery products? Do I want to buy better brands? Do I want to buy a nicer suit or jacket? Do I want to buy better shoes? Or do I want to go on a nice holiday? And so when we look at the middle class, instead of taking an income approach, we think about behaviors. And then, so we, we call this group of consumers, instead of the global middle class, we call them the new consumer class because they're moving into a space where they have the ability to make consumer decisions. And if we look across, say, Southeast Asia as an example, we would estimate the size of the global middle class or the new consumer class in Southeast Asia today is around 180 million consumers. Now, if you look forward to the, over the next 10 years, we actually expect to see that consumer base, that new consumer class, to almost double, to be over 400 million consumers in Southeast Asia alone. So that's a tremendous opportunity. Now, as you start to think about this definition of behavior, the question becomes, well, how do we differentiate that, that upper level, that, that higher income tier. You know, we, we, we hear a lot of discussion around premiums we are, or high-end consumers. And again, we take that behavioral-based approach. It's not about being a billionaire. It's not about make, have, having a paycheck of $300,000 a year. It's actually about having a low elasticity in the household budget, which means my household budget is impervious to changes in the market, where I can make decisions, very big decisions, that have a very minimal impact on the way I spend. 
And so if we think about the Asia, and what's very unique uh, at this point in the world, and we look back even historically with massive changes in wealth, we've seen wealth has driven different consumption behaviors. If we look at Asia, and we look at Asia right now, it's an opportunity where we see the new consumer class is doubling. The premium class is actually tripling over the next 10 years. And it's an amazing time to operate in this space. All right, so, so basically, um, I've reached the middle class once I go to Starbucks. Absolutely. I may go to Starbucks, or I may you know, buy a nice coffee machine at home and make my own espresso. Okay, so it's the kind of product categories that Absolutely. you go for, right? Because you start with income, but you have a behavioral definition in terms of disposable income. So Correct. Really Correct. Okay. Now, now, one thing that's more interesting, I would say, about the, the, the middle class or the new consumer class that we see here, which is very different than the last time we saw the great wealth expansion, which was the post-World War II era, right, which drove a lot of growth in the developing markets. Post-World War II era, we actually saw, as wealth increased, consumers started buying more things. They had bigger houses, they bought more cars, they bought more clothes. Their wardrobes expanded, their stomachs expanded, <laughs> their lifestyles expanded. But now if we take a look at Asia, what's interesting about the new consumer class in Asia is they're not actually consuming more things, they're actually consuming better things. And so they're trading up. So, so they consume what? Brands? They can consume brands, um, they can consume experiences. So one thing to think about the, the new consumer class in Asia, they're very aspirational, they're very confident. And while they may be value seeking, they're also experience driven. And so as they look to make those investments, they'll spend on better, more premium things. I might buy for my children a baby diaper right, that solves very core needs of safety. I might buy beverage brands that provide something to me of some subsidence. And so the way I spend is very different. I might spend on more finer clothes. I may actually take better trips, but I'm not actually expanding the amount of consumption. I'm just consuming higher quality and better things. I mean, one great example, we take a look at a market like the Philippines, and we go out and we talk to consumers. As they move into the global, into this new consumer class, they still may live in a five or 15 meters square foot home, but I may have a Galaxy 3S, right? I may actually have a very nice designer handbag. And so what they're doing is they're increasing their lifestyle, right? They're, they're aspiring to be that premium consumer. Okay, so let me just summarize. So uh, once I enter the middle class, I want certain categories. Not only certain categories, I actually want, for example, brands of quality. And on top of this, I want something that is premium. Is that, that a fair summary? It's a, it's a fair summary. And, and that is uh, based on the research that, that Nielsen has done on the, Absolutely. Class, on the middle yeah. class. Okay, great. Um, now, what do clients do with that kind of research? <laughs> yeah, from, from a client standpoint, the biggest challenge is saying, how do we meet those needs? Right? How do we drive value in those spaces? So if, if consumers are looking to say, how do I upscale my lifestyle? How do I move into a more profitable space? What are the products I need to deliver against? What are those needs that they see real tangible value in that I can drive that point of differentiation? Right? Can I cater to that need that they have around their, their hair or their skincare? Like we heard earlier. Uh, do I cater to that need around that vacation or that holiday? Do I cater to that need around their household budget? Or, or, an, or their household food bill. So consumers look for different needs in different areas. And the challenge for many clients, the challenge for many manufacturers out there, is to understand what those needs are. That consumers are willing to invest in, willing to pay that experiential premium. I mean, one really good example, even in the retail space that we see, is that instead of seeing growth in the big hyper markets across Southeast Asia, we actually see growth in more convenience-oriented shopping occasions. I want to buy locally, I want to buy close to home, and I'm willing to pay more of a premium for my basket because it's right around the corner. I don't have to travel as far. Yep, fascinating stuff. I'll get back to you in a moment because I understand another theme that you have identified recently within Nielsen is, is this notion of the customer wants to be connected with everything and there are some uh, interesting findings and insights coming out of that as well. So we'll get back to that in a moment. But I'd like to talk to one of your clients first, if that's possible, uh, GOT, right? Uh, you've been working with uh, Nielsen, right? For example, uh, I mean the company is now Mondelez, but Mondelez, Mondelez right? But it used to be Kraft, right? That's right. All right. So um, and and Nielsen has helped you in, in sort of the partnership with Nielsen to establish your your company and your business um, in Asia in particular, right? So can you tell us? Sure, sure. 
So, you know, so first of all, uh, we are Mondelez International. In fact, we are just heading into our first year anniversary as a new company, new entity uh, this month. Um, so, a couple of years ago, uh, Erstwhile Craft made a big acquisition into Cadbury, which opened up a tremendous opportunity in a majority world, you know, 60% of the consumers being in developed market and developing markets and that's where bulk of 60% of our, 40% uh, of our revenues is actually coming from. So with that acquisition, it opened up a different landscape of consumers, shoppers, channels. Um, it opened up different categories for us. So first while we were not uh, big into chocolate. Now we've, with the acquisition of Capri, we've got commanding positions in markets like India where Cadbury is chocolate, right? Uh, similarly, Australia, similarly UK. Um, so as we've done that, our scale, our footprint has tremendously shifted. And you know, as you can imagine, what do we need? We need to understand these markets and we need to understand them really fast. So how does Nielsen help you? Right, so, so Nielsen has been a strategic partner for us in understanding the complexity and complexity really fast. So um, as Mondelez, we invest behind uh, the short term, the long term, and the really far out as we were talking about earlier about what is future really, right? right. And, and Nielsen is where we actually look to, you know, partner with them and they have, you know, really differentiated thinking around their methodologies, their ideation, tools like BASES. Um, or tools like neuroscience, where we are trying to understand packaging. You know, how do we actually deliver true value and holistic value to the consumers? They are helping us understand the channel landscape, whether it is you know the western part of China, which is you know a different new opportunity, or whether it is going into new white space geographies. So it's it's the holistic touch points of our business that they are trying to uh, they they help us in real time. They also help us in, you know, the, we have tremendous market share leadership in, in many of our categories. They are com continuously helping us keep their competitive. So there's all sorts of methodologies that you have when you work with a client like this. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, anything from neuroscience was being mentioned to uh, studies about the channel. Uh, and it's also very much about the understanding of the middle class because absolutely. the middle class wants your sort of product, yes, right? right? That's right. The products being food products. Um, yeah. Now, those are very probably the most local products, is that fair? Yes and no, but I think we approach it differently. Uh, so there are, you know, there is one is, you know, what you want locally and the other is this, you know, the earlier we were talking about, we heard from, I think Robert and from Abacus, is this globalization of the world that's happening. Here sitting in the room, we have access to the whole world actually in our fingertips. Uh, last few, a couple of years ago, we have actually launched Oreo in India. It's a globally loved brand. It's a bundle that just works. You know, kids delight. Um, just uh, you know, last Halloween there was a kid who came to my condo, and as soon as he realized I had Oreo, and I'm part of the organization that makes Oreo, just the eyes were just widening by the moment. So it's that universal appeal of the products. Um, of course, we continuously keep to the forefront and center of our decision making is the consumer, their tastes, their interest in certain ingredients. So we bring bundles like Belvita is a breakfast biscuit that we've launched in Australia. We had a presence in, in Europe. So of course, globalization. So we are bringing those proven bundles. But what we do is we actually work with partners like Nielsen. We ensure that those taste profiles, ingredients are matching very closely. And you know, our history is such that we have the acquisition of Loom and, and through Cadbury. I that love we've, exactly, see? Yeah. You know, See, I'm German. Absolutely. So the penetration yeah, levels right. that we are talking about. Yeah. You know, so we actually make sure that those bundles stay true to the consumers and we always continuously talk to them to improve even further and enhance those profiles. Right. So uh, so you do believe in more well, global brands? Right? Localization. Localization. Okay. Yes. That's the way that's a cheap way out now. Um, it's the <laughs> proven way, it's the right way to actually be true to your consumer. Okay. And what is the global part and what is the local part in your localized part? Well, as I mentioned, so we have brands around the world. We have the scale of taking that knowledge, taking those playbooks, you know, and quickly taking that, hey, the consumer trends are actually ready and are clamoring for this product. Or actually taking something from Asia and saying that, well, hey, there is a proven bundle of convenience packaging for tag from, from Philippines. Can we take it to a Latin American market? So the organization works very, very seamlessly between global, regional, and local. 
to keep the consumer centricity in mind as well as bringing in the scale and the profiles and the proven bundles all together. Very sophisticated approach. Now, going forward, okay? Throughout the day, there were, um, there were always these projections, you know, four or five years out, where will the industry be? In the technology business we are hearing, it's not even five years out, you know, long term is two years, right? Okay, so in your business, um, what's happening with food, with food culture, where do you expect the big uh, trends and innovations then to come from? It's something we spend a lot of time and effort thinking about continuously. As I was mentioning about, I think it's about a balance of what do we want near term and what do we want really long term. And we have dedicated teams who are actually continuously thinking about that. I myself closer to hard consumer insights, you know, we're talking to consumers, we're talking to shoppers, engaging with them. Not only that, we are actually engaging with our customers to understand where do they want to, where do they see the retail landscape change. You know, the likes of Walmarts or Tesco's uh, in this part of the world in Asia especially. Um, I think it's a total package we think about ingredients. You know, as I mentioned, that is it is it really the functional need that's clamoring? So we put a lot of effort behind understanding that. We put a lot of effort behind, you know, if you are my consumer, what does your day look like? What are you really looking for? Is it that convenience that you're looking for? If you're a consumer in Jakarta, you're probably spending a lot of time in your car. So spending the spending a day in the life. Right, exactly. And then There's looking and, and sort of uh, trend spotting it into the future yeah. as well. You know, where do we want to take our brands to be? And, and, you know, we, and we I like this about, idea because it's not just about your product as such, it's, it's fitting the product into people's lives. Absolutely. And, and you know, we, we earlier heard about connectedness, for example, yeah. right? And real time connectedness. So, several of us must have suffered through the recent haze that took place in June, right? Coming from the, the forest bird fires. So, what Oreo did in Singapore was very interesting. They quickly created a Facebook campaign called Breathe Sweet Singapore. Very quickly, they were able to take our brand. We were able to take our brand into the lives of a current situation that was happening. And make it relevant. Make it very relevant. And a medium that was relevant. So when you ask me about future, I think we are thinking about a multifaceted. You know, where are the lives changing? My, I mean, we might have soon a generation which is so used to looking down that whole world will pass by them and they would have no idea. So how do I make sure that I'm bringing my brands into their lives and understanding their behaviors and, and, and then the mediums they're used to? Okay, very good. And um, Balaji, yes. um, 3M, the DNA of 3M is innovation, some people say. Um, how about innovation here, here in Asia? I mean, you've been successful with sort of micro-innovation, entrepreneurship, and in, and in Asia in particular, what is, uh, what is 3M doing? Yes, so, but uh, Jyoti, to illustrate the difference with uh, 3M and the other companies, I think when we had the haze in Singapore, we were rushing to get the gas masks, you know, which we make you know, into the hands of more and more consumers and governments and stakeholders. Only as we are a, you know, we are a manufacturing and technology company that's there in multiple industry verticals, industry of healthcare, um, electronics, uh, consumer. But I think, I believe that at the heart of the organization, we are really a diversified technology company. So we have deep expertise in more than 46 technology verticals, as we call them. And our, our job, or our, our mission really is to connect those technology platforms to serve, you know, to innovate and serve the local needs of consumers. So in the globalization continuum, I think we would be intrinsically very local. So our philosophy is to innovate locally next to the customer, next to the consumer. And we tend to leverage global and regional scale only where relevant. I think that's the starting point, of course. You know, operationally, we have to make um, in order to find the balance um, in, in different situations. So as an example of uh, the innovation in Asia, let me talk about um, uh, scotch Bright. It's one of our stronger consumer brands, um, scouring and floor care. Um, so to illustrate how the technology platforms are connected differently in Korea, we are winning in you know, the floor care category. And scotch Bright, not known to many people, is also a big player in the floor care space and not just scouring. We're winning there by innovating constantly on disposable paper mops. Okay, so a stream of innovation with different technologies going into disposable paper, that's helping us win. Whereas in India, you know, we're getting great traction with something like a basic floor cloth, which has some scouring 
technology, you know, for the Indian uh, attendees of the conference, uh, we call it a pocha, right? So it's the same technology platform of non-woven materials, which is our expertise, but it's just getting applied in different ways and connected in different ways to help meet local consumer needs. You know? I mean, some of these innovations are, of course, radical. Others are not that radical, but they are still innovations. We had a question earlier today about, uh, I guess it was about Moleskin, right. which was more of a marketing innovation. But uh, even within the real technological innovations, there, there are various degrees. Absolutely. Now, which ones in Asia typically are we talking radical innovations? Are we talking improving people's lives through these smaller step-by-step -step innovations? So. Um I think our intrinsically we see, so we, we classify innovation internally as class three, four, five, where five tends to be the more radical new categories, new markets, new technologies. Three tends to be more incremental stuff. I would say a lot of our innovation has moved into the class four categories somewhere in the middle. And we are pushing the envelope on class five from Asia. But the direction really is how can we create categories, innovation, you know, eventually innovation that comes from there. Yeah, very good. And, and working with Nielsen, um, what can Nielsen do for a, what was a Type 4 company, a Type 4, 5, 5, what did you call it? Yeah, uh, yeah company. So, um, one of the areas where, uh, you know, uh, Nielsen is, is one of our partners in this NDO to understand consumer insights and local needs better. And one of the areas where we're partnering right now is the, uh, the students or education market and just trying to understand that a lot more um, for my business. Uh, the, the limit, um, for my business is basically stationary and office supplies, right? And as the name suggests, it's more office supplies oriented. And, you know, there's a lot of opportunity in this part of the world around you know, just the education and student market. So we're working together to penetrate and understand what are the, you know, unmet important needs in this area, right? And how do we line up our innovation existing and future with humble pieces of paper that we call post-it notes, you know, has a little bit of a thesis stuck on it, but, you know, with that and in a Scotch brand portfolio and any other innovation that we could bring into the segment for more technologies, how do we cross connect them in the services market? Right. So that's an area where we're partnering with those about itself. Right. It was very interesting for me to hear from your clients, from your, from your, your customers. And and you have some other sort of, you have the word bigger, big data here as well, right? <laughs> I mean, you have all sorts of methodologies, big data, insights. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and one of the themes right now is, of course, this connected world of the, of the customer. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. And what are some of the insights there that you have discovered with various methodologies? Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting. I'll take, it, I'll take a step back. You think about most all of us in this room here, we, we grew up in a world where we lived, where knowledge was something we read in a paper, right? We read in a book, or information or brand we engage with from a, a television campaign. And so if we think about that world, and we think about the world we're now this foot we have, the second foot we have in today, is a world where information is actually something we see in a tablet, and something we see on our phone. And when we think about the, the growth of this new consumer class in Asia, uh, we see them coming into this world where their first touch point, their exposure to a brand, and their first touch point and exposure to information can actually be on a smartphone, right? it can be on a tablet. We can very simply compare the, the tablet, pen, or, sorry, the smartphone penetration in Asia versus the smartphone penetration in developed markets. In developed markets, we see roughly 40% to 50% of consumers have a smartphone. In Asia, we see roughly 70% of consumers have a smartphone. So many of the consumers, as they look to understand more, engage with the brand more, it's through these different platforms. I'm very engaged on my phone. I'm very engaged on my tablet. I'll find different ways to watch television programs and access content through the internet or through my phone or through my tablet. Is that relevant to your business, the food business, these, this revolution? That Absolutely. Talking about. Absolutely. I mean, take for example the recent trend we are finding and uh, we are closely watching is China. Uh, retailing is moving very fast into that. It's it's still slow, small, but it's a rapid fire growth. So understanding online retailing has become a, a interesting uh, you know trend for us to uh, to take further. And you know, Nielsen is uh, one of the partners that helps us understand. Um, and again, going back to understanding, you know, our target groups, moms and their kids, they are connecting with each other in the same house in, a, in very interesting ways which are non-traditional anymore. 
You could be upstairs in a house and your child is downstairs. Yeah, you just see what? You see a smartphone to come in. That's right. Yeah, I mean, you, you may also see in China, sure. you see consumers getting online to, to make orders, right? I see, we see this in the, the, the baby care category where many consumers are getting online to order their diapers. They don't want to go, have to go out to the, the grocery store and shop and find, carry home a big package of diapers. So they get on their internet, they get on their, their phone, place an order, and it shows up that same day. And yeah, that's part of a service business then, isn't it? it? It is. It is a different model, but you need to understand these trends. And that's where the consumer centricity comes into it or the shopper centricity. Sometimes they're the same people, sometimes they're the different people. I'd like to open it up uh, to, the, to, the, to the audience, to the floor, to your questions. Um, Where we're looking to take those trends and that access to information and put that into the hands of the consumers. And so in many ways, at Nielsen, we've pioneered a lot around helping uh, different clients understand their marketplace and the and growth and trends in the marketplace. Uh, there's an application we're actually launching this year that's going to enable the same thing for consumers to understand different growth in mobile applications, different growth in, in areas where they actually want to engage. And so we're actually looking at that, that shift in paradigm and saying there's not just access to information and content for you know, clients, but actually the consumer in the marketplace. How do we help them become more informed around the different opportunities that they have? Any further questions? Sticky notes goes first. Yeah. Post-it notes. <laughs> <laughs> as, we, as, as we like to refer to them in our presentation. Um, I, so, um, do sticky notes have or post-it notes have a relevance in today's world? Absolutely. And more and more of the research that we're doing shows that you know the human connect is so integral to the creativity and collaboration process. You cannot substitute that experience only with a pure digital play. Right? But what's needed is a solution that seamlessly integrates digital you know, and the human world so that you're not taking down a note and using a camera, clicking the note and putting that in some organization, digital storage warehouse, you know, and then trying to struggle to refer to it when you really need it. So what's really needed is that piece. I don't know if you followed the press recently. Um, we globally, just recently, two weeks ago, we globally announced a strategic partnership with Evernote. Posted in Evernote. Okay, which has been announced in the US and Japan, and it will slowly find its way across the world. And it's not me, but you had the founder of Evernote saying, paper is not dead. And Evernote is partnering with Moleskin, and they have partnered with us. And what we're trying to do is we started with step one of how do you make the interface seamless. Okay, and um, the first step was very, very interesting. You can just, you know, you can download the Evernote uh, posted app. You can take photographs of posted notes, and it just handwriting scans and it, it understands the text, recognizes the text, and based on the color of the note, you can categorize different actions to help you sort and organize better, as an example. But this is Gen 1. You know, as we develop the partnership, I think we're going to get more and more uh, better at integrating these two experiences. And, you know, I facilitate a lot of workshops, and I'm fairly digitally connected. Um, and we have a three-year-old son, a personal story. He's been on the iPad since he was six months old, if you may, playing around with it. But I see that he learns the most when there is a direct human-to-human -human engagement, right? It's more intense. I mean, it's just we are hardwired to take information in a different way, multi-sensory, not just, you know, one particular interface. It is a part of life, not the only part of life. I mean, that's our philosophy. Sure. So, hi, Sami. Um, so I think in terms of digital, it is more, there are multi dimensions to it, right? One is the digital commerce part, and let's sort of leave that on the side. The other part is actually the usage and the consumption. And again, bringing us all to think about the person, in your case, your daughter, who's actually consuming that medium. Now, what better than food to get people connected, right? It's the first medium and one of the most popular media, pan universal to all human behaviors to bring people together. Now, whether she's doing this, and I can actually quote my son's example, there will be a bunch of boys sitting in a room playing at each other, eating snacks, and playing some game in which they are actually combating each other on their own individual screens. Right? So it is the presence of that brand which brings them together in their digital world, and the presence that we are commanding to say that, hey, when you love these brands, you find them on the mediums, that the world that you are living in which is continuously becoming digital for these, uh, for these emerging young consumers. 
and that's where I feel that we are actually proactively and continuously uh, taking our brands there and also continuously in conversations with consumers to understand how can we actually uh, you know, ensure emerging medias, mobile phones is another area. Now we, for example, understand a lot of our impulse categories are present in hot zone, in the checkout area. Right? You are at the last uh, moment of your purchase cycle and there is this <coughs> trident gum or a stride gum that you are about to grab. But at the same time, we are also competing with that screen in front of you, in your hand, where you are looking down continuously. So we want to make sure that we are present in that medium and connecting with you. So those are the ways that are actually, uh, for Mondelez, it's a very complementary situation for us to connect with our, our consumers and shoppers. You know, I have a last question for, for Matthew, we're almost out of time. Uh, you know, there are always these hot, hot new methodologies, <laughs> right? And techniques that you find in the market research firms. Yes. Is that fair? And, uh, and can you give us two or three of the hottest ones right now that all the clients want? Um, one of the big areas for us is actually diving into the neurospace. Okay. So actually starting to look at not so much how consumers talk about brands right, or fill out survey questions, but actually what's going on in their brains, how those different synapses are firing when they see they're exposed to a brand or they're exposed to a television ad. When are they actually engaged? Um, what are they looking at on the product? What captures their mind? What captures their attention? It's really allowing us to kind of peel back that understanding of consumer in a much deeper way than we ever could before. Um, and it gives us deeper insights to say, what are those trigger points? Uh, that actually, that moment of truth where that synapse fires and a consumer starts to respond before they even know it, but subconsciously they start to respond to that brand, they start to respond to the stimulus on your packaging, they start to respond to the stimulus in the advertising. Right, right, right. In fact, you have a neuro company, right? Absolutely. Right. Um, I've done a neuro study too. <laughs> it's really a hot thing also if you're in, in science. I did an fMRI study right, yeah. on brands and so on. The only problem with that stuff is we just don't know enough about the brain to know what's really going on. Yeah. It's a challenge. It's, you know, I think it's still it, 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 It's still evolving. It's an interesting space. There, there's areas where I think we can learn a lot, mm -hmm. and there's areas where there's still a lot to learn as well. Right. And so it's, it's an emerging space. Uh, there's, there is certain areas where we do find good application, and there's other areas we're still exploring to try more. But it's a hot new technology. Is there another one? I mean, just give us one more. Uh, the, the other I mean, big, big data is here. That's I mean, one, right? big, big data is, a, is honestly a big area for us. It's an area where we're actually starting to combine massive different data sets to understand not just what consumers watch and see on television, but connect that to the way they behave. Yeah, so right. how does that change my purchase behavior at home? How does that change the, the behavior I have and the way I spend? So connecting a lot of what we watch with what consumers buy and also how consumers spend. Very interesting. I mean, you know, in physics, they have this big problem, unresolved problem between relativity theory and yeah. and make, uh, and, uh, um, and the, the, the little tiny stuff, you know, the, the, the whatever mechanics. And um, it's similar here because the neuro gives you a really, really fine-tuned view of very few consumers. There are usually very, very few people in the study, but then you have the big data sets, right, yeah. with massive millions of observations, right? Mm -hmm. often, right? And I think bringing these two worlds together, just as physics has to bring quantum mechanics, quantum mechanics. quantum mechanics and relativity theory together, I think is one of the big challenges uh, for the next five to ten years in the, in the research field. I absolutely agree. Great. So I'm, you are at the forefront of that uh, to the benefit of your clients. I want to thank everybody who was on that panel. A very exciting panel. Thank you. Thank you.